previously on that bullshit. Piece of shit. What idiot designed this thing? This place is epic. Are you hitting the crack bank? An evil plot? I don't know. You look so dumb. I can't believe somebody was dumb enough to leave the keys in this thing. You what? <laughs> Then nothing will stop me. I know I say that every time, but this time, really, nothing will stop me. Stop that. They're either being used for their magical powers by an evil man, or to make underwear to be. Ah, 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 ah. Who are you calling nothing? Pee-wee, since the boss said nothing will stop me, and Sonic here is going to stop him. It's like the boss was calling Sonic. No. How about... In conclusion... Whoever this belongs to, I don't want it. You can have this shit back, because, bitch, I don't want it. Take it the fuck back. Get it away from me. Waddling right along, we get yet another fourth wall break that goes no deeper than I am aware that there is an audience watching me. There's nothing clever about this, nothing witty, no thought was put into it beyond break the fourth wall equals funny, right? Congratulations, this only gets more irritating every time you do it. And smack dab after that concussion-inducing failure, we get the beginning of that wet fart of a running joke. Norman reading silly willy things from the translator, big laugh, much funny. Are you ready to have this same thing shoved down your throat every time Norman pulls out his custom discount Chuck E. Cheese iPad with absolutely zero variation or clever subversion? Because if not, well, that's just too bad for you, buddy. The mouse man said to wrangle every piece of this mess. When you consider what we're doing from a robot's point of view, it's actually pretty gruesome. Don't think about it. If you say so. Oh, yeah, no. You know what? No, yeah. What in the solitaire suckery am I watching? Is that supposed to be funny? How? You don't just get to say, this is pretty gruesome, then say, don't think about it, and pretend that's a joke. It's not. It's some irony drunk hipster's witless excuse for a joke. Why couldn't they say something like, You ever think about how gruesome this kind of thing is? Cleaning up the body parts of other robots? I'm not paid to think. You get paid? And just leave it at that. I know that's not exactly hysterical or witty, but it's inoffensive and gets out of the way quickly, which is the very least you could do when writing bottom-of-the-barrel comedy. God, they can't even do throwaway jokes right. But what's this? There's an inkling of setup and payoff in this dumb anus script. I'm missing an arm. Have you got an arm? No, but really, how much can it matter? I guess it can't matter much. So the reason why Sarcasm Orb and Idiot Cube are in this story is so their incompetence can push the plot forward? Wow, no thank you. I'm allergic to stupid. So first of all, why wouldn't Circle Thing and Square Thing have some sort of sensors or scanners that can easily identify where the parts of the Wonder Wheel of Wumbo are? They're highly advanced robots, specifically built for data analysis and cleaning, so what gives? They had to have watched the boss battle in its entirety, so they must have watched the miserable go round explode in real time. So can't they just go into their memory banks, watch the explosion in slow motion, and map the trajectory of the arm and calculate where it would most likely end up? I mean, they should be able to do this. Quite easily, in fact. So, and if you're saying to yourself, well, they're just lazy little goofy boys, they don't want to work extra hard for robot that reintroduces yet another issue. Why in the rippling pectorals of Terry Crews would Robotnik program them or allow them to malfunction into robots that do not want to work extra hard for him? Why would he let that happen? What possible reason does he have for letting them be the worst possible assistants slash servants he could possibly have? Why wouldn't he make his word law for them, something that they can't even think of disobeying or ignoring? Alien energy proficient rocket scientist people, 
He wouldn't have programmed his robot servants to be freaking lazy. That makes absolutely no sense. But even if we choose to ignore all of that, which I refuse to do, but for the sake of the argument, let's put a pin in it. Boop, pin in. There you go. This scene is so overwhelmingly bad because of what it means for the rest of the story. This entire sequence is a magical vending machine of convenience and happenstance. For instance, it is convenient that the underwhelming hula hoop of doom blew up in such a way that its arm was still intact enough to do any significant damage to anything. All of the other parts that they picked up are harmless and inoffensive except that one arm. If the dumb thing blew up in any other way, that arm would be just another piece on the ground and the story would completely change. It's even more convenient that the one thing most important to Robotnik's plan in the entire interstellar theme park, which is comprised of five whole alien planets by the way, is the one thing that the exploded arm lodges itself into. It just so happens to hit this one thing instead of literally anything else on this whole five planet large complex. The odds of that happening are so hilariously astronomical, I can't even comprehend the math required to accurately calculate how improbable that is. But it's even more convenient that it hits friggin' anything, considering there's a whole lot of space surrounding this interstellar theme park, so by definition, there's a bunch of space that this piece of shrapnel could've just floated through harmlessly for eternity. Again, the odds against this scenario are beyond reason and logic. But it's even more convenient that the vitally important thing that Robotnik's entire plan revolves around is in an explosion's distance of the first level of the game, slash, the place where Jake arrives. When every other time, Robotnik has kept his secret weapon or ultimate MacGuffin hidden right in the heart of his most fortified base, which is absolutely the smart thing to do. But this time he just said, put it right next to the entrance, lol, because reasons we're never told. I don't... <laughs> I just, why did he do this? But it's even more convenient that only a single piece of the boss has launched this far away from all the other pieces, despite that not being how explosions work. Primary color things don't even leave the boss area to clean up the rest of the boss. So how in the golden pipes of Mariah Carey did that one piece make it all the way over there? Just... How? But it's even more convenient that the very important evil plot device is built in such a way that a shallow breach in the outer shell of the device will completely mess the whole thing up. I mean, if you damage anything that big just on the outermost part of it, it'll still be able to function. This thing is the size of a planetary body. There is no friggin' way that this arm has done serious damage to this massive thing. I can buy that it isn't running at full capacity because of the arm puncture, but it's not completely compromised, no way. This is like getting a splinter in your arm. It'll be uncomfortable, but you can still see, hear, talk, taste, walk, move, your other arm, and about a thousand other things. One splinter in your arm, no matter how painful, won't stop you from functioning. Yet the writer said, it's broke now, lol. So there you have it. But it's even more convenient still that Robotnik has only instructed primary color things to look for the scraps of the boss robot instead of having any other badniks littered all over the five planet complex round up the robot parts. How about that alarm function I brought up earlier? A simple indicator that something is not running as it should which will bring it to Robotnik's attention immediately so he has a chance to fix it in time. Again, basic fundamental shiz is just absent from this highly advanced sci-fi location, all because the writers are hickory dickory dipsticks. Do you see how all of those coincidences and contrivances had to come together so the rest of the story can even happen? If just one small thing happened even slightly different than it ends up happening, which I've established it very well should have, then the story completely changes. That's bad writing, in case you were unaware. Luck, convenience, coincidences, and contrivances are cancer to a script. Ear, nose, and throat cancer. You should never allow these to prop up your story. Ever. It's horrendously bad. Experience has taught me to investigate anything that glows. So that was a fucking lie. Further proof that Norman is absolutely superfluous to this entire game. 
excellent. I love having my characters stomped on after being paraded around as hollow caricatures of themselves. Just perfect. Jake talks to something that cannot answer him back nor register if it even heard what he said because he's huffing his own farts and nearly gets blown up by the slowest attack ever. Which reminds me that every scene in this game is incredibly slow. Like cold molasses slow. There's so much padding and useless dialogue and just slow movement, which is the exact reverse opposite of what a Sonic the Hedgehog game should be. Not only does this script not let go of jokes, it can't let go of anything, making the pacing equivalent to a trek through a mountain of mashed potatoes on a bum leg. Slow, excruciating, and maddening. I mean, all they had to do is trim the fat and it would work much better. Experience has taught me to investigate anything that glows. Uh, excuse me. Somehow I knew you'd say that. Let's date. That's it. It took 15 seconds for me to do that. Give me two hours and the entire story would move much faster because I would cut out all the jokes and all the scenes with Swollen Ball and Lumpy Box. Cue second underwhelming boss battle and cut to Jake sucking his own dick for how amazing his victory over a freaking pirate ship on land was. Like, bruh, you have had way better boss battles with much more intimidating opponents. This was underwhelming as feck. It's so below average, it's in the friggin' sewer system. Do not brag about this victory. It was friggin' abysmal. Also, was that supposed to be funny or amusing or something? Because... Help! Norman proceeds to tell us information that we already know and does his mistranslation shtick as if that's magically become funny and clever in the last five minutes. But speaking of things that have never been funny, we get to the infamous quintessential worst joke of the entire script. Anyway, it seems an evil man, and you might know him, who they call... <laughs> That's the best thing I've heard. Huh, so here's the thing. Norman shouldn't have said this in the first place. It's a clear example of forcefully injecting comedy into a moment where it wasn't originally. In this scene, Norman is trying to get across important information about Robotnik's plan for the oversized sperm worms. This isn't the time to forcefully inject a derailing joke. The time to do that was a few seconds before this moment. You know, when Norman said funny thing and proceeded to say something not funny, that's the second best place you can put this joke. The primary place to put this joke is the trash compactor, where it belongs. But once again, the writers do not let the joke go. They keep shoving it down the audience's throat as they scream, Laugh! Laugh! I'm funny, goddammit! Laugh at my joke! But that's not how jokes work. You have to know when to let it run its course. Don't keep throwing it around. Let it be. This joke should have died right here. Or, at the very most, be brought back at the end of the game. Unfortunately, it's repeated several times, not only in this game, but every game after this one. Which makes me want to commit regicide. That's good intel. Keep working on it. That's a fucking lie. Next up in this haphazard collection of events linked with Spaghetti String, our heroes investigate the next generator as a once brilliant man does something that tests my patience. Indeed I could, but I'm right here behind this generator. That's it, Hedgehog. Stand there and be a nice little target. Who in the hell are you talking to, and why are you doing that? You're supposed to be sneaking up on them, you clumsy coastlaw cuck! Tails, is that you humming? You heard the humming and not the maniacal monologuing? 
What the fried chicken snap is this? Where am I? Robochud, who is apparently the sneakiest man in all the land, takes advantage of the selective deafness of our heroes and fires concentrated lavender at them. Norman, despite having super speed on par with Jake, two working eyes, and unfortunately a working mouth, decides not to speak up before said purple nerfo is shot at them and jumps to heroically sacrifice himself to save Jake from a fate most violet. And sure enough... Nils, buddy? <laughs> He's my buddy now. What have you done to him? Me? I did nothing at all. Why don't... Unless shooting him with my mind control beam that runs on alien energy counts is doing something to him. Does it? Yes. Wow. Okay, that's a pretty good weapon to use against Jake. Turn his friends into his enemies and you significantly handicap him. All right, that's the first good thing that's happened in this story. Excellent. Except for one teeny tiny problem. Uh, how do extraterrestrial blowpin farts translate into mind control? There's no hint of telepathic or mental powers from any of the many cosmic jellyfish featured in this game. Hyper Go Go Power Ranger juice isn't described as anything other than another generic energy source to power stuff. So what makes this energy different from, say, chaos energy, or soul energy, or life energy? or friggin' electric energy. Why exactly is this specific energy needed in order to power the mind control ray when it has absolutely no connection to mind control inherently and it seems to work just like all the other various forms of energy in this series? And why in the soiled granny panties does it take so much energy to power this thing? That's like 200 gallons of hyperbole fluid. You only get... 58 seconds of power out of that much? Why would you purposefully use something that incredibly inefficient to power anything if you don't have to? I, I'm just so friggin' confused. Why does this game continue to shoot itself in the foot? Can Robotnik just explain why hyperhension a go-go baby gas is better to use than a goddamn wall socket? Especially when there are multiple games that use other established sources of energy to power a mind control device. Why is he going through all of this trouble? What the crap do wannabe Zelda fairies have to do with mind control? And really, you couldn't have at least let Jake and Norman duke it out for a minute before the energy was all used up? That was the only bit of actual drama in stakes in this entire story and it evaporated in less than a minute. You ruined the only potentially good thing in the game almost immediately. Outstanding job, you cone-headed cucks. Huh? Where am I? Why is my nose hair tingling? Stop talking about nose hair, you chafy, unfunny scrotum sacks. Huh? Ran out of juice. Well, I'll get more. Lots more. And then I won't just control one little punk, but the whole universe. How? 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 Like, actually, how? Logistically, how? We are gonna come back to this. Good lord, will we come back to this. But come on. How in the Rudy Tootie Cowboy Shooty will you get enough to control not just one planet, but all the planets in the universe. That's not even a remote possibility. I doubt you could control a corner of a crowded Denny's, much less the entire universe with this. Do you understand the concept of fuel efficiency, you deep-fried musky pomegranate? Flailing right behind that scene, we're treated to a neck-breaking shift in tone as Norman, fresh from having his mind shucked and his autonomy violently ripped away from him, gets a nice big I told you so from someone who claims to be his friend. Incredible. Especially considering Jake was very worried about his well-being not ten seconds ago, but <laughs> who needs consistency, right? Also, Norman seems to have memory loss as a side effect of the mind control ray, so instead of Jake telling him what just happened like a decent person would, he decides to say, lol, I was right, now give me money. Our protagonist, ladies and gentlemen. And once again, to add insult to injury, the joke isn't funny. 
<laughs> Pay up, Tails. I told you he had an evil plot, and coming here was a good idea. There it is, straight from the horse's mouth. No, sir, I don't like it. Uh, we didn't bet. Well? Dang. Uh-uh. Like, come on. If you're gonna snap my neck to jerk me to a completely different tone, can you at least make it worth the pain? Can you at least make the joke the best joke ever? Does this even qualify as a joke? After killing Rainbow Blimp, Jake and Norman give a totally unnecessary recap of events as if a lot has happened so far. This tells us that once again, the writers have so little self-awareness they can't tell their story is so simple that a brain-dead infant could follow it. Which was the entire thought process behind this game. But the noteworthy part is when Norman reveals... So basically, Eggman is using five tractor beam generators to hold their planet in orbit while he scoops the aliens all up. Hold a whole planet? Well, it's tiny, but still, yeah. What an interesting and original idea that has never been used before this game. Jake has surely never seen Robotnik do that before. You're literally not Sonic, Jake. One poor math joke later and Norman makes sure to mention something that further solidifies just how heroic Jake truly is in this game. We should get moving. Yakuza, the aliens don't have much time. Don't have much time. Don't have much time. Don't have much time. I want everybody to really keep this in mind as we move forward. The aliens don't have much time Meaning that if Jake doesn't hurry, they could all die or get seriously injured. All their life force could be drained from them, their species wiped out, and five innocent planets irreversibly corrupted into desolate abominations in Robotnik's image. And as nonsensical as Robotnik's plan is for the hyperbolic time chamber energy, he can still do a lot of damage if he mind controls the right people and gets them to do things they wouldn't normally do. So Jake now knows that time is of the essence and he cannot afford to lounge around or it'll spell catastrophe for an entire race of innocent creatures. Which is unfortunate for them because in the next scene, Jake meanders around at a leisurely pace commenting about the scenery of their planet being violated. I want to kill these insufferable months. No, seriously, they do not deserve to live. They are actively allowing the deaths of hundreds upon hundreds of innocent creatures who are literally begging them for help. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. Ah, yes, a follow-up to the voice chip plot. Thank heavens, it's vitally important in this story that we get the voice chip sorted out. You know, all of this time wasted on Cubot's voice chip when the easiest and most effective solution is... Take out the goddamn voice chip. He doesn't need to speak. 99% of Robotnik's machines don't talk and they function just fine. Metal Sonic is the most effective robot he's ever created, and it only speaks in its Neo form, which only existed for one game. And it wasn't until he started talking that he decided to betray Robotnik which one would think is a good freaking incentive to never give any of his creations the ability to speak. Give me one good reason why giving Cubot of all of his robots speech capabilities was a good thing for Robotnik. Go on, try getting that pig to fly. I'll wait. Shortly, I will have no need for those idiots. Wait a minute. I will have no need for those idiots. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, do you have a need for them now? Really? You mind telling me what that need they fulfill is? 
because they genuinely don't add anything to your plans or anything. In fact, the literal opposite is true in this very game. They're just asinine floating shapes that provide the most unfunny of commentary and belittlement of you. So what, pray tell, do they bring to the frickin' table, good sir? Please, enlighten me. Can we just take a moment and consider the implications of this statement? Robotnik is not only saying his own creations are idiots, which is a slight on himself, if anything, but he's expressed not just a need for them, but a desire to be free of them as if he's actually being forced to have these things by his side at all times by some unknown force. Do you understand what that means? It means the writers have jumped the proverbial shark so much they've inserted a meta comment about their own meta decision to force these dumb anus insults to comic relief on Robotnik. They've just metaceptioned themselves. Robotnik literally wants to be free of the writing, but can't break free because the writers are in full control, yet have written him in a way that he recognizes on some level that he's been broken and forced to be someone he's not. Do you derive yep. some sick pleasure from torturing this character so intensely? You moldy, mangled wheel of douchebags! Robotnik reminds us through a hammy monologue to the friggin' dust particles in the room that there is a ticking clock and specifies that it's just a few hours away from being over for the Technicolor tapeworms. So Jake has really got to get moving since he's got three whole other planets to travel to and locate the generators on, something he later admits gets progressively harder to do. So he should be blasting through at top speed to help save the lives and worlds of the innocent creatures he has now come to befriend and even rely on to progress through the story, right? You know, as alien as this place is, there's something very... Eggmanish about it. <laughs> I'm seriously contemplating regicide right now. Jake, how could you just loaf around like a damp bump on a log while people are dying? They are literally screaming, begging to be saved, and you're caught up reiterating crap you already know and talking about freaking ice cream. Where am I and how do I get back to the real world? The longer Jake spends jabbering on about nothing and feeding his cosmic-sized ego, the sentient saw squids that are already captured are dying. In just this scene alone, I imagine there's a whole family of aliens that have perished needlessly, all because Jake has to drag out every single faux comedy scene he's in. Sweet Sylvester Stallone, I can't take this and we're barely halfway through? Initiating lazy mode. Jake blatantly lies about the bosses getting progressively more difficult for him to beat. Then he says one of the most meta things in the entire game, which is seriously saying something, and it comes out of freaking nowhere. This joke has nothing to do with anything, and it's just a random non sequitur that detracts from the story. Even if it made you laugh personally, you have to admit that this was not the place for it. Once again, Jake has been informed that the weird flying squigglies are near death before he got to this boss fight. He knows what's at stake, and yet here he is, killing the precious time he has by making the most ironic declarations imaginable. While the cosmic jellyfish are dying, he's declaring emphatically that he'll save them and stop Robotnik from killing them. The self-awareness is off the charts with this one. It's just, Robotnik has no way of seeing or hearing you because as previously established, the writers have ignored basic, fundamental logic and reasoning to service some insanely unfunny jokes. This includes not having security cameras on any part of this hulking sci-fi monstrosity. 
So not only is the joke wildly disjointed from the rest of the scene, not only is it said at the most inappropriate time in the story, not only is it delivered in the worst way imaginable, but it's also not even heard by the person it's directed at. So this is just a massive, shining monument of comedic failure. As the wisps are steady, dying. Splendid. Again, I don't care if it made you giggle. There are fundamental flaws with this joke that breaks logic, characters, and narrative in ways that both astonish and infuriate. And if that wasn't bad enough... Wow, sometimes I even impress myself. For a second there, I wasn't sure I was going to pull it off. Well, who am I kidding? We both knew how this would end. Uh, are you talking to the broken robot who can't hear you? How many Technicolor tapeworms just died while you sucked your own dick in front of a smoldering corpse, Jake? Twenty? Forty? Sixty? Maybe hundreds died. Hundreds of innocent creatures that literally begged you to help them and assisted you on your journey, all because you vowed of your own volition to save them. And now their friends and family are dead because you felt the need to gloat to, and I cannot believe I'm saying this, a goddamned non-sentient heap of scrap metal that you yourself caused. Who in the flabulous folds of Oprah Winfrey even are you, and how do you think you're a hero? Norman wonders this too, but not for long, because whoop, it's time for more overblown, unreasonably long anti-comedy jokes! Hey, did somebody here order a clobbering? Are you sure? It says somebody ordered an extra large clobbering topped with everything. Hmm, okay. Tell you what, I can't take this thing back, so I'll give you an extra large clobbering for nothing. Hope you're hungry. This is so aggressively unfunny. It's almost impressive. As the wisps are steady dying. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. That's gonna be it for this part of the Sonic Colors rant, which is shaping up to be quite the big boy indeed. <laughs> uh, we still got maybe one more part to go i hope only one it's probably gonna be two i should stop saying that it's it's gonna be two uh we got two more parts to go and that's gonna be fun because we're gonna be going through quite a lot of references in those last parts and we're gonna wrap the whole thing up in a nice little bow uh to really stamp that final this game really sucks uh seal on this thing so <laughs> If you like the vid and you want to see more like it, please consider supporting on Patreon, where for any amount that you choose, you have access to all of my work, including YouTube stuff, but also non-YouTube stuff, such as my Sonic Adventure 2 prequel comic. Art for it is being made pretty much every month, so give that a look if you are interested. And then, of course, other art, right? Other art and stuff, is it's all in there. Uh, future video stuff that I'm kind of kicking around that's in there too uh, basically everything every single thing that I do make write, whatever all of its all of its in patreon so if you want to support the channel if you want to support my other stuff uh, then you pay whatever amount you want to there is no you know ceiling there is no different tiers or anything it's just whatever you feel like giving you get access to everything so yeah that that is an option also if you don't want to do a monthly payment like patreon you could always go to the one-time payment which is Kofi, and you can just drop in whatever amount you want one time and that's it you're all done uh but if you're not familiar with Kofi, then there is cash app again one-time payment you pay it one time and then that's it you're done you're good and you know you can do that as many times as you want to including once and never again it's all fine uh, so anyway, thanks for watching. You guys have been great as always, and I'll see you next video.